Hi, welcome everyone. Great to, great to see you all here. Uh, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the Newcomb Institute for Computational Science. And on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you all to this year's fall Donahoe Colloquium. Uh, the Mind and the Net, What the Web is Doing to Our Brains, from the writer Nick Carr. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These lectures are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006 here at Dartmouth. The colloquium is a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute, whose aim is to support and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64 and former trustee of the college. Uh, in fact, Bill is here with us today. It's really a, been a pleasure spending the day with him. And I hope you don't mind if I take a moment to recognize you, Bill, and thank you for everything you've done for the Institute and the college. The projects and ideas discussed here in the Donahoe Colloquia and supported by Newcomb span the spectrum of human interests. They come from and bridge the arts and the humanities, medicine, the sciences, and the social sciences. They inform policy making and enable efforts in social justice. It's a range of ideas and technologies that reflect both the utility and the centrality of the digital and the computational in today's world. But computational thinking is more than just central to our lives, it's pervasive. This is at least in part what we mean when we speak of our culture as being a digital culture, or what I sometimes think might better be called a computational one. Like any culture, it shapes us even as we shape it. And in the course of working to understand and negotiate the shifting identities of the shaper and the shaped, we find ourselves confronted by difficult but necessary questions about the societal transformations that we are affecting and experiencing. Today's speaker, the writer Nick Carr, is one of our most thoughtful explorers of this complicated and fascinating landscape. His most recent book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, was a 2011 Pulitzer Prize nominee and a New York Times bestseller. It's a book that's made me think very carefully and I hope somewhat more deeply about the place of technology in my own life and work. Nick is also the author of two other influential books, The Big Switch, Rewiring the World from Edison to Google, and Does IT Matter? His new book, The Glass Cage, Automation and Us, is due to be out in fall of 2014. Nick has been a columnist for The Guardian in London and, and has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Wired, The New Republic, and many other publications. Earlier in his career, he was executive editor of the Harvard Business Review. Nick has an MA in English and American Literature and Language from Harvard University, but more significantly, he was awarded a BA in English from Dartmouth College as a member of the class of 1981. It's my pleasure to welcome Nick back to Hanover to deliver the fall 2013 Donahoe Colloquium. Let's welcome Nick. Thank you very much, Dan, um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming out this afternoon. It's a great pleasure, as always, to come back to Hanover and, and visit the campus, and it's a, a great honor to have been invited to share some of my ideas with you today, and I want to express my gratitude to the Newcomb Institute, everyone at the Newcomb Institute, for, for inviting me and for sponsoring my visit here. I was, uh, a couple of days ago, I was looking through the Dartmouth computing timeline uh, at the Dartmouth EDU site, and I discovered that the college bought its very first computer in 1959, and I even know what kind it was, an LGP30, uh, and it just so happens that I was born in 1939. So I feel that the fate of the story of computing at Dartmouth and my own story of computing have, have been entangled kind of from the start. And that entanglement certainly became deeper when I arrived here uh, in 1977 and used a computer, a digital computer, for the first time. And some of you will remember the Kiewit Computation Center, um, no longer uh, 
no longer in existence, but back then, if you wanted to use a computer, you had to go to the Kiewit Computation Center, this single-story concrete building tucked behind Baker Library. And I was thinking that was, that was a while ago, but it wasn't really that long ago in the greater scheme of things, 35 years or so. Um, and in that short period of time, 35 years, we've, we've gone from a world which, in which it was very hard for an average person to use a computer. You actually had to go to this special building and get a special password to tap in for a brief period into a, into a mainframe through a time-sharing system. Um, and today it's entirely different. You'd, you'd have to make a real big effort today to find a place where there isn't a computer. Um, and, and that kind of shift has happened so quickly that, that in some ways I don't think we've allowed ourselves to step back from it uh, and think critically about all the things that have changed uh, in our personal lives, uh, in our work lives, school lives, because we've become so used to having this constant flow of, uh, of information and, and so enthusiastic about all the benefits uh, that can bring us. And so that's what I'd like to talk about a little today is some of the effects that maybe we haven't thought through all that carefully. And, and that should, even as we enjoy the benefits of computers and, and the internet and social media and so forth, we should maybe pause also and examine the way we've come to use these technologies. When I was, um, I, I'll illustrate my talk with a few slides here, and when I was putting, putting these slides together, I, I was trying to come up with a good image or photograph to kind of introduce my talk and introduce the subject. And of course I did what we all do when we're looking for a photograph these days. I went online, tried to find one on the web, but uh, couldn't find the, the one that really did what I wanted it to do. And out of the blue, this guy from Hawaii, a guy named Doug, who I had never met, didn't know, sent me an email. Um, and he said, I was reading your book and wanted to share with you this photo I took of the environment in which I was reading it. And of course, he wasn't, he wasn't reading a print version. He was reading a Kindle version running on, Kindle, on the Kindle app on his iPad. Um, and in the, on the one hand, this, this kind of shows one of the great benefits we have because we're so connected these days. You know, for, for some guy out of the blue to send me a message with a photograph uh, in the past would have been quite cumbersome and probably wouldn't have happened. And, and here he had no problem reaching out and, and, and sending me this message and filling a need that I had, which was a, a good photograph to introduce, introduce my talk. Um, because he also mentioned that as he, as he was reading my book in, in looking around his surroundings, he, he realized that he was really deeply kind of embedded in uh, what Dan called the digital culture, kind of digital lifestyle. He's got, uh, you know, he's got his, his iPad that he's reading from, he's got his iPhone on, he's got what looks like an iMac up there, um, some coffee to make sure he can handle everything very, very quickly. <laughs> um, and, and he raised the concern that what, what struck him was that his relationship with the technology, as it became so ubiquitous and so much a part of his life, had kind of changed in that it wasn't long ago that he, he thought of computers as a tool. Uh, and you'd go, you'd, you'd, you'd open your, you know, you'd launch your desktop or, or, or open your laptop when you wanted to get a particular thing done, whether it was at work or whether it was at home. And so the computer was really a servant and he was the master and his, the relationship was like the relationship we have to any tool that we use to get something done. And that seemed to have shifted, uh, he thought, and that increasingly he felt that the gadgets uh, in the online services and the apps were determining how he behaved and were determining what he looked at, uh, how he experienced life in a way. And so the relationship had shifted and, and increasingly he thought of himself as the servant to the technology. And this was very much kind of very much replicated the experience that I had that, that was the impetus, was the inspiration uh, for me to go out and, and do the research that ultimately led to the book, The Shallows. I, I'd been a big, ever since my days at, uh, at Dartmouth, I'd been fascinated with computers, uh, had, had been a, uh, you know, an early adopter of PCs, uh, had, had really enjoyed all the benefits we get 
uh, from computers and as a writer found you know, incredible efficiencies in being able to go online to do research uh, and, and so forth. But I also noticed a few years ago that I was having a lot of trouble concentrating. I was having a lot of trouble focusing my attention on one thing for a long period of time. Um, and I particularly noticed it when I'd sit down to read a book or read a long article, you know, away from any computer, uh, in, even in a quiet room, and I'd get a page or two in and really have this desire to check my email and, you know, go back to the computer and do some Googling. And, and I realized that even when I wasn't at the computer, my mind seemed to want to behave the way it behaves when I was at the computer, taking in lots of information, juggling lots of different tasks, hopping from one page to another, and it became hard to kind of turn that instinct, what seemed to be an instinct, off in my mind and really filter out distractions and, and, and focus. And, and that raised the question, you know, is it possible, it, uh, were those two things even related, use of technology in these changes that I experienced in, in, in my thinking? Because another explanation, one that I didn't really want to entertain, but I did entertain, was, well, I'm getting older and middle-aged mind rot is setting in or something. And, and so I, I, I began to look into that question. Can a technology have a deep influence on the way we think? And that led me into kind of two streams of research. Uh, one was to look at, at recent neuroscientific s studies and um, um, experiments that kind of provide at least hints of how technology influences our brain. And then the other, uh, the other stream of research was to look back in time, look back in history, and see if there were any earlier examples of technologies uh, that, that seem to have a big influence on the way people think, the way society, or even the way society thinks about thinking and what's, in, what's important in the way we think. And what became clear to me very, very quickly is that among all the huge number of tools that human beings have developed and used through history, there's one set, and I think it's a very fairly small set, but in a particularly important set, that are the tools of the mind, the tools we use to think with in some ways. And I, call, uh, I think you could call these intellectual technologies. So any tool, uh, media tool or other tool, that you use to gather information, to categorize information, to analyze information, uh, to communicate your thoughts to other people um, would fall into this category. And as I began to, to think of technology in these terms, in, in these kind of categories, it became clear that if you look through history, one way to look at history of, history of civilization in general, and even pre-civilization, is a story of how technologies have shaped us, uh, shaped the way we act, the way we behave, the way we think, the way we perceive things. And you can go back, I would argue, to one of the earliest, if not the earliest, intellectual technologies, the technology of the map. Well, maps have been around so long and are so commonplace now that we hardly even think of them as a technology. But of course, somebody had to invent a map way back in, we don't know who, it was in prehistory a long time ago. Um, and when you think about it, when people started using maps, that was a radical change uh, in the way they thought about space, one of the most important things we have to think about. Before the map came along, if you wanted to know where you were, if you wanted to get from one place to another, you did it purely through your senses. You looked around, uh, you listened for things, maybe you smelt things, and that was how you located yourself in the world. As soon as you introduce the map, you get a radically new way to think about space, a very abstract way. Suddenly, you can think about space as this abstract picture that's separated from the natural world. Um, and it requires a very different way, kind of a very diff different way of cognition um, suddenly uh, is, is brought into the world. And if you look at the history of map making, history of uh, cartography, one of the themes is that this new tool shaped in, in a pretty dramatic way the way people think. And not just the way they think about space. I mean, there were, obviously there are all sorts of benefits you get or uses you get with a, with a map that's drawn. You can suddenly establish boundaries and territories and you can map routes and chart routes and go from one place to another with a fair degree of confidence you're going to arrive where you set out to arrive. But beyond that, introducing this, this new way of thinking about nature 
allowed people to start thinking more abstractly in general. So suddenly, you could begin to think about the hidden patterns that lie behind what your senses told you. And I would argue that this was, was in prehistory, one of, the, one of the major shifts in the way people think. Uh, obviously, that kind of abstract thinking was latent in our minds, and I'm sure people uh, experienced it before the map came along, but the map kind of spread that more abstract way of thinking about nature and thinking about the world. You get a, a similar phenomenon much later, much more recently, with the introduction of the mechanical clock, which radically changes the way we think about time. And this happened in the 15th century or the 16th century. Uh, first monks began to develop mechanical clocks in order to regulate their prayer, uh, times of prayer during the day. Uh, but it quickly moved out into society as a whole. And again, if you think about it, before the mechanical clock came along, the way people thought about time was very much as a natural process, a natural cyclical kind of flow, uh, very much attached to uh, the sun rising and setting, uh, the, the way the, the sun was positioned and the stars were positioned in the sky at various times of the year. So very much a natural kind of sensory appreciation of time, similar to the way we, we once appreciated space. Uh, introduced the mechanical clock, and suddenly this natural, this sense of time as this natural flow is replaced by a sense of time as a series of precisely measurable units, hours, minutes, seconds. Um, and here, again, you can trace broader changes in the way people think that are probably related to this. Uh, in order to adapt to this technology, you start to think in very different ways. And I don't think it's any coincidence that you have uh, the introduction of the scientific method, all sorts of scientific experiments, um, in short order after you have the introduction of the mechanical clock. It, it, for one reason, a lot of experiments, a lot of science can't happen until you have a way of measuring time precisely. But I think it more importantly and more deeply, you see the introduction of a way of thinking that's very much tied to precise measurement, that's very much tied to uh, ch long chains of cause and effect that can be kind of, that, that, that resemble the way time uh, influences, uh, changes nature and changes society uh, over long periods. Um, and so another example of how a new technology gets broadly adopted, and it shifts the way people think, and it also shifts the way society defines the way we should think. If you want the kind of high-level lesson from all this, I, I, think it, I think it's that every technology, particularly every intellectual technology, that comes to be broadly adopted has within it what, I, what I'll call an intellectual ethic. And by that, I simply mean that any technology that we use to think with is going to encourage certain kinds of thinking and reward certain kinds of thinking, the ways of thinking that it is actually designed to aid. But on the other hand, it's going to uh, discourage the ways of thinking that it doesn't help you to do. Um, and if you, if you uh, have ever read or come across Marshall McLuhan's work, he had, he had the famous sentence, uh, the medium is the message, I think basically what I'm saying is what he meant by that, that the medium, the technology, is the most important thing in thinking about how our minds are shaped. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the content that comes through the medium, it's the medium itself that ultimately has the biggest effect. And so the medium carries its message, or what I'm calling its intellectual ethic, into the world, and as the technology spreads, the medium spreads, so too does that intellectual ethic, and we begin to value and practice uh, the particular ways of thinking that the technology allows, and we begin to move away from alternative ways of thinking that, that we aren't aided in doing by the technology. So in thinking about the internet, uh, and about digital media, computation, computers in general, I think the most important thing we have to ask ourselves, and unfortunately I don't think we really have asked ourselves this that much, is what is the net's intellectual ethic? What kinds of thinking in us individually, in, us, in society as a whole, is it encouraging? 
And what kinds of thinking is it pushing us away from simply because it's not good at, at, at aiding us in those other ways? And the reason this is so important is that we've never had a technology like the internet. Um, we've never had a medium that does so much uh, with so many different types of information in that we're constantly I interacting with. Even if you think about television, incredibly important uh, medium, technology medium, you know, with television, there were times of the day that you watch TV, but then there were large amounts of times of the day where you didn't tend to watch TV. You'd come home from work or school, maybe watch some shows, you'd watch some TV on, on the weekends and stuff, but you didn't, you didn't go to work and have a TV sitting there in front of your desk and you watch it all day and you didn't have a TV in your pocket and that you carried around and you know, when you had dinner pulled out uh, at a restaurant and watched some TV. So even though, even though we spent enormous amounts of time and continue to spend enormous amount of, amounts of time watching TV, we weren't interacting with the technology constantly in so many ways as we do today uh, with computers and, and particularly now that we have uh, very powerful general purpose computers the size of smartphones that are constantly connected to the internet uh, and that we can pull out at, uh, at every whim or every incoming message and, and give it a glance. Well, when you think about what the net's intellectual ethic is, I think all of us who have used it have a good idea what kind of thinking it encourages or, or what kind of environment it, it surrounds us with that shapes the way we think. I, I mean, the, it seems to me that the, the most striking characteristic of the net is that it's an incredibly information-rich environment. And that's why we like it so much. We like information. We like to know everything that's going on around us. And if you keep cranking up the information that you're supplying to people about what's going on around them, they will take that information in and they will ratchet up their use of the technology. And I think if you look at the technological underpinnings of the net, the kinds of characteristics that have been built into the technology by the choices both the designers made and the users made, you see that most of them, most of the, the basic characteristics support the information richness of the technology. So there's the connectivity that the, the, that the technology supplies that allows you know, a guy I don't know in Hawaii to send me a photograph. Uh, that allows all of you who use it to connect with various people, colleagues, uh, and also connect with all sorts of information sources, uh, all sorts of social media that, that are constantly bringing you new information, uh, richer kind of connectivity that we've, than we've ever had with any earlier communication medium. Uh, there's the multiplicity of information that is supplied uh, through the net. It used to be that if you wanted to do a particular, if you wanted to do a kind of, any kind of particular interaction with, with a form of information, you'd go to a different kind of tool. So if you wanted to listen to music, you'd turn on the radio or turn on your stereo. If you wanted to read text, you'd grab a book or a magazine. Um, if you wanted to watch motion pictures, you'd go to the movies or you'd turn on your TV. Because all, that, all those different kinds of information, different modes of information can be digitized, they can all be now fed through a single device, uh, through a single system. So suddenly, instead of this uh, information landscape where you had to pick and choose how you received information at any given moment, we get information in all possible modes, complete multimedia, every time we, we look at our smartphone or our tablet um, or our laptop or whatever. There's all, uh, the web is also built for velocity. Uh, it's by far the fastest information distribution system we've ever had. Um, and in some ways, thinking about the velocity of information flow that's been made possible by computers in the net gives you, I would argue, kind of the strongest visceral sense of how a technology can change the way we perceive the world and think about the world. Because when you, when you think about how we've come to expect information to come at us, it's incredible that you expect, you can actually measure people's reactions to uh, the information flow they're getting through a computer in fractions of a second. And in fact, big internet companies, Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, they track 
how people respond based on milliseconds of information flow. Uh, so, if in, so if it takes, say, longer than a second or two for a video to load, uh, you start to get antsy. And we're talking, this is a second. <laughs> it used to be, you know, you might, you might get a little annoyed if a letter you're expecting didn't come for a few days. Now it's a second. Um, and, and you can really measure these things uh, uh, down to the fraction of the second. People's behavior changes and changes dramatically in that short a period of time because we've been trained, in effect, to expect responses uh, at a snap of a finger, um, something that, that we never really expected before. And finally, in, in some ways, most important of all is the interactivity that's built into the technology. Uh, so it used to be, you know, if you listened to the radio or your stereo or read a newspaper, you had limited ways of sending out your own messages about what you were doing. The internet, because it's a two-way communication medi medium, allows you to constantly send out messages as well as receive them. And of course, as much as we like to gather information about what's going on around us, we also like to make our own, we also like to make our own voices heard, uh, connect with other people. So this interactivity. Um, adds to the richness and it also adds to our desire to be online all the time. In fact, all of these characteristics are very much things that we see as benefits of the computer. Uh, we love fast, multimedia, uh, constant flows of information. Well, the only problem is that a information-rich environment is also, particularly if it has all these characteristics, is also by its very nature an, in, an interruption rich environment. So the, the fast flow of information in all sorts of different forms is constantly interrupting us, constantly requiring us to divide our attention. Uh, and what you get less and less of is any opportunity to turn off the flow um, and, and exist in an environment without interruptions. Uh, and of course, Life has been full of distractions forever, and it's certainly been full of distractions and interruptions in the modern world and with the introduction of mass media. But this technology raises the level of distraction and interruption to an unprecedented level because you have to remember that distractions and interruptions are cumulative. So the fact that we've always had them is important, but the fact that once you add more and more and more to them, uh, they become all the more uh, hard to resist and hard to ignore. If, if I was going to give, and I am going to give, if I was going to give an, an image for the kind of environment we've created for ourselves, I think a good one is an image of a video game. Um, if you think about the types of thinking that are encouraged and rewarded by video games, they very much reflect the types of thinking that are encouraged and rewarded when we go online in general or when we pull out our smartphone in general. Uh, with a video game, you want your brain to see as, much in, as many things as possible simultaneously. Uh, and you want to react very, very quickly to every new piece of information that comes in. And of course, if you're not very good at that, uh, if you're slow to see lots of different information, process lots of information, you end up you end up dead, or at least your character does. And fortunately, with video games, you come back to life, and you can do it all over again, and do it again, and again, and again. Um, and if you look at some of the studies uh, that have been done recently about video games in particular, but I think the online world in general, you see that, in fact, as we adapt to this intensive flow of information coming at us through screens, our brains actually seem to get better at keeping track of lots of different stimuli, particularly visual stimuli. So our visual acuity tends to increase. And there have been a lot of studies uh, about video games, some showing negative effects, some sh showing positive effects. But one of the most famous was published in, in the journal Nature in 2003. And the researchers gathered a group of heavy video gamers, another group of people who didn't play video games, and gave them a number of different cognitive tests. And one of the tests was, uh, to determine how good they were at keeping track of lots of different visual stimuli simultaneously. Um, and so as you go up the chart, the error rate uh, goes up. And as you go across, the number of different elements coming at you on the screen increases. 
And what they found is the, the light blue line is the non-gamers and the darker line is the gamers. What they found is up until you had about three different things that you had to keep track of, both groups performed basically as well. But as soon as you started ratcheting up the flow of information, the non-gamers signif started making significantly more errors than did the gamers. And the conclusion is that our brains begin to change, begin to adapt, uh, and we become uh, more adept at visual acuity. Uh, and that's, in general, a good thing. That doesn't only help you when you're playing games. Uh, because we live in an information-rich society, this is probably an advantage to many people to be able to know lots of things that are coming at you simultaneously. So this is at least a, a hint of, of, first of all, that our brains do adapt and adapt pretty readily, and also that there can be definite benefits uh, of spending all this, a lot of time online. But what kinds of, what ways of thinking does the internet not encourage us to do? Uh, or even actively discourage us from doing? Well, I think it's all the types of thinking that for at least 100 years have been kind of symbolized by Rodin's famous sculpture, The Thinker. Um, contemplative ways of thinking, calm ways of thinking, highly attentive, concentrated, focused ways of thinking, kind of all the th ways of thinking that become, only become possible when you turn off the spigot of information, uh, when you're able to screen out distractions rather than allowing your attention to be diverted and determined by the, uh, the, the, the distractions coming at you. Now, you know, we have no idea what the thinker is, what this guy is, is thinking about as he sits there with his chin on his uh, fist, but you know, he's probably not composing a tweet, for instance. <laughs> he's, he's really, he, he's able to control his mind, to control his thoughts in a way that opens up ways of thinking that I think in general are hard for people to do. Um, ways of thinking that require you to back away uh, from distractions and interruptions and really focus your mind. And if, again, if you begin to look at some of the studies that have been done about how we behave when we're in front of a computer or a smartphone or a cell phone when we're online, you begin to see how rare that experience, the experience of deep, attentive thought, is becoming. Um, if you look at, for instance, there have been studies of how long people spend uh, looking at a web page when they're browsing the web or Googling stuff or, or whatever. Uh, and what you see is that, on average, uh, people look at a web page for 10 seconds or less before they go somewhere else. And what's particularly interesting about the studies is that it doesn't matter if you add lots, of more, lots more information to a page, if you put lots more text on the page, it still stays at about that uh, level. A few seconds, then you find a link, click, and you're gone. Um, there was a really interesting study of email use a few years ago. Uh, the researchers looked at how often people at work who had a computer in front of them glanced at their email inbox. And first they went out and asked the employees, the workers, to give an estimate of how often they looked at their email inbox. And, they, and on average, the people said three to four times an hour. <laughs> then they put eye tracking goggles on those same people and they actually measured where their eyes focused uh, over the course of a day or two or something and they found that these people were actually glancing at their email inbox 30 to 40 times an hour. So 10 times more than they were even conscious uh, of, of turning their attention to their email. Pretty much you know, every second or two they were glancing to see if something new had arrived. Um, if you look at text messaging uh, which has exploded, particularly among young people, over the last five or ten years. Um, every time I kind of look, the, the number of texts a month goes up a, a, a bit, but right now, the average teen sends or receives about 3,300 texts um, a month. And for the average teenage girl, it's over 4,000 texts a month. And when you break that down, that means you're receiving or sending a text about every six minutes throughout the entire time you're awake. Um, and, and all of these kind, uh, all of this infer fast gathering of information gets ratcheted up even more when you start to have, when you have a smartphone with you that provides 
uh, incredible amounts of information in all sorts of different forms, and keeps you permanently connected, essentially, to uh, the net or to networks in general. And they've done studies and found that more than half of people who have a mobile device of any kind uh, glance at it, say they glance at it, once, at least once every 30 minutes. About a third of people say they glance at it about every 10 minutes. And that's a pretty high rate of use, but I can almost guarantee you that just as people wildly underestimate how often they, they check their email, this is almost definitely understated by a huge degree. People are probably glancing at or at least thinking about uh, their smartphone or their cell phone even more often than that. And so, again, if you just looked at one of these statistics, you might think, oh, well, that's a lot, but, you know, not so bad. The important thing is all of these things are cumulative. Uh, these are all happening at once. You can start adding in Twitter. You can start adding in Facebook. Uh, you can start adding in Google or Bing or whatever. And you start to get a picture of people who are really in a perpetual state of distraction pretty much all day long. I think we've... <coughs> If you look at the, the history of how the web, how our interaction with the web is designed, I think it's a story of internet companies constantly looking for ways to ratchet up the flow. Um, so we've moved in the last few years from a dominant metaphor of information online uh, being the page. You'd go to a web page and there might be lots of stuff going on, but it was, you know, we called it a page because it resembled a page in a magazine or a book. Well, that's becoming less important, and now the dominant metaphor is the stream of information. So you don't even have to go out and you know, look for pages, look for information. It's coming to you all the time automatically as you sign up for different social networks, different alerts and everything. Um, and you can see why internet companies would want to ratchet this up, because that's how they make money. Uh, the more things you look at online, the more information companies collect about you, and information is very valuable, and also the more opportunities they get to show you advertisements. Um, so combined with our, what seems to be our natural desire to know everything that's going on, we have uh, corporate incentives to constantly speed up the flow of information in order to make more profits. If you look at patterns of the way people read online, you see a very similar phenomenon going on. Um, the, again, there's been a lot of studies These use those eye-tracking goggles as well, and, and what the researchers do is they try to see what people look at when they look at a page of text, for instance, online. And these show uh, the results of three different experiments with three different web pages, and the kind of dark reddish-orange areas are areas of strong focus, the yellow areas are areas of, of weaker focus, and then the blue areas are just glances. Uh, skimming uh, going on. And what you see over and over again is what the researchers call an F pattern of reading. Essentially, and if you pay attention to how you, you read online, you'll probably, you'll probably see you do this. People tend to glance across the, f the entire length of the first couple of lines of text. Then your eyes drift down a little bit along the margin. You go about halfway across a few lines, and then your eyes just trail off down the margin, and you click and get out of there and go somewhere else. Um, and in and of itself, this isn't anything bad. I mean, if you, looked at how if you look at how people, say, read newspapers or read magazines, you probably often see this kind of pattern. It's, it's a skimming, scanning pattern. It's a very important way of reading because there's, there are times when you just want to know what's going on here, what's this about, should I invest more time in reading it deeply. The concern is that this is the default mode that you see when people read online, when they read off of off of the screen. We, we see, this seems to be the only way we read in many cases. It becomes, becomes rare to see somebody actually read in the way you'll read a book, for instance, when you're immersed in it, which is actually read every word, go through it, turn the page, and do the same thing again. Uh, so again, more evidence of how the net, how personal computers in, in all their different forms uh, encourage us to be information browsers, information gra grazers, to try to get as much information as possible, as quickly as possible. Well, so what? I mean, maybe that's not so bad. Uh, as, as the stories about maps and clocks show, we, our brains do adapt. 
when you have new technologies come along. And certainly, we've, since we've created this environment in which there's unlimited amounts of information, uh, maybe it's best that we optimize our brains to take in lots of information very, very quickly. And maybe it's not so important that we're, we don't have time to gather our thoughts or to uh, concentrate on one thing. And there's some, I, I have to say, there's some truth to that. Um, you often are rewarded these days, whether in your social life or your work life or whatever, for the ability to take in as much information as possible, as quickly as possible. But I think what's very important to recognize is that when you do this all the time, you are losing out on opportunities to practice ways of thinking that require attention. Uh, and as it turns out, those are some of the most important and most valuable ways of thinking. And there's reasons for this. There's reasons why you can't think deeply when you're distracted, when you're constantly interrupted. Uh, and one of the most important is the way our memory works. Uh, memory is very, very complicated, and I'll, I'll simplify a bit here. But there are two basic forms of memory that we're, we're constantly using. Uh, one is called working memory. That's essentially the contents of your consciousness at any moment. It's what is you're actively thinking about, or actively the, the perceptions that are coming in through your senses or whatever. Uh, that's your working memory. It's very short-term memory. And what we know about it is that working memory has an incredibly small capacity. It's like a thimble-sized store of information. Uh, it used to be thought that you could keep maybe se around seven elements of information in your conscious mind, in your working memory, at any moment. Now, researchers think it's more like two to four elements of information at any time. Then there's working memory, uh, then there's, excuse me, long-term memory, and that's what we think of, what we generally think of when we talk about memory. It's all the things that you remember, uh, facts, experiences, emotions, events, and so forth. Um, and it turns out that the only way to get information from this thimble-sized store to this vast store of long-term memory, there's never been any uh, scientists who's been able to say exactly how big long-term memory is. It seems to expand as it needs to expand. So it's kind of, if, if working memory is a thimble, it's kind of a bathtub. To get information over to, from working memory to long-term memory, to consolidate it, as psychologists say, requires attention. The only way you can do that is to attend to that information for some period of time, to kind of rehearse it in your mind, to think about it. And it's only by doing that and pulling that information over to working memory that you start to create associations between all the facts you know, all the experiences you've had, those emotions. Uh, and it's those associations, more than the individual bits of information, that give rise to the deepest forms of thought. It's only when we plug new information into a broader context that we can begin to think conceptually and begin to think critically uh, and, and engage in some types of creative thinking that requires you to break with what everybody else is thinking about. That only happens uh, when you are able to consolidate information into your long-term memory. When you're always distracted, when you have more information coming at you than your working memory can, can contain, you are hampered greatly in this ability to, con to consolidate memories. And the reason is, is because working memory has much, such a small capacity, if it's full and something new comes at you, some new alert, some new stimulus, you have to get rid of something that's in there in order to fit the new piece of information in. And so we've created this digital environment for ourselves, which is compelling, but which essentially puts us into a state of cognitive overload pretty much all the time. And cognitive overload is an actual physical state of mind when so much information is coming at you so quickly that you can't attend to anything long enough to form rich memories and rich associations. So there may be all sorts of benefits from optimizing our brain for fast-paced information gathering, but we're cutting ourselves off from what, at least historically, has been viewed as the highest, uh, or the, at least the deepest, forms of thinking that are available to human beings, to the human mind. What makes this an even bigger concern is discoveries about 
what brain science is called neuroplasticity, the malleability of the human brain throughout your lifetime. When I was, uh, when I was growing up, I remember being taught that, being taught that our brains were malleable, were plastic for about the first 20 years of our lives. When we were kids, that's when we kind of created all the connections between neurons and laid all the circuits for our brain. And then you hit 20 and that was it. You know, after that, neurons dying off, brain circuits unraveling. It was kind of a very ugly picture of the adult mind. And fortunately, it was wrong uh, because beginning in the late 60s, and continuing to today, scientists have found that, in fact, adult brains are also very adaptable. Not as malleable as kids' brains, but our brains are constantly changing. Uh, const we're, we're creating new neurons, uh, creating new connections, disassembling other connections as we go through life. And, and basically, uh, when we change the environment in which we think, uh, we ultimately change our habits of mind and our brain, which seeks efficiency, Optimizes, optimizes itself at a physical level for those new habits. Um, and so if you think about technology, technology is a very important part of our intellectual environment, our environment that we uh, think in, and hence there are these changes that go on as we adapt to new technologies, particularly technologies that we're constantly using, constantly interacting with. And I think this, this was fa particularly fascinating to me because it helped explain why I would have trouble concentrating, trouble reading, even when I wasn't using my computer. It's because there were ch my brain, I had essentially trained my brain at a deep level to, th to think in a very distracted way, multitasking way, and had begun to, I think, undermine my ability to even engage in more attentive thought. It went against kind of the grain of how I had trained my brain through all the time I spent online. And here, too, I have to say that research into the effects of, uh, of Internet use is still in its early stages, and there's not all that much of it. But we're beginning to see signs of these kind of long-term adaptations in our brains and in the way we think as we come to uh, use the technology more and more. Uh, and one of the most interesting and scary studies was published uh, in 2009 by a group of researchers at Stanford. Um, and this, this research was kind of similar to that earlier research about gamers. These researchers also gathered a, two groups of people. Uh, one group was heavy media multitaskers, spent a lot of time online uh, jumping around from piece of information to piece of information. The other people were people who used computers and, and the internet much less. And they gave these two groups six different basic tests of, of cognitive ability. Uh, the heavy multitaskers did worse on all six tests. And one of the most interesting uh, of those tests was a test that gauged how well people, how good people are at distinguishing important information from trivia. And when you think about it, that's a core skill that kind of underpins almost every cognitive skill you have. If you can't, if you can't distinguish important stuff from trivia, then you're, you're going to waste a whole lot of of your thinking on trivia. Um, and what happens, it, this time, the, uh, rather than the errors increasing, the accuracy of people's ability to make that distinction goes up as, as you go up the chart. And again, the number of distractors increases as you go across. Um, the light blue line is the heavy multitaskers. The dark one is the light multitaskers. Up to about two distractors coming at you. People, both groups performed basically as well. Um, and then once you increase that, the heavy multitasker's performance at this uh, important task falls off and falls off dramatically. Uh, the, the lead researcher, a guy named Clifford Nass, uh, summarized it by saying that, that heavy users of, uh, uh, of the net, heavy multitaskers, are suckers for irrelevancy. And what, his, what they theorize um, is that the more we use the net, the more we multitask, we're essentially training ourselves not to care about whether a piece of information is important or not. What we're training ourselves to care about is how new the information is. And so our focus, our behavior, begins to be determined by simply the desire to get whatever is the newest piece of information. Um, again, 
uh, when you think about the long-term consequences of this, it's, it's, it is pretty frightening, I think, that, that suddenly you have people who aren't particularly interested in what's important and, in fact, will immediately shift their focus away from what's important simply because a new thing, a new stimulus comes at them um, in, in, in whether it's complete trivia or not doesn't so much matter. The only thing that matters is that it's new. Also in 2009, another, um, another researcher, a developmental psychologist named Patricia Greenfield, I think she's at UCLA, who's been studying uh, for many years now uh, the effects of technology and media on the way people think and the way kids learn. Um, she did a review of all the literature that's out there that, that has looked at this issue. Uh, more than 50 studies, I think, she examined. And the common theme that she found is that there's a fundamental trade-off that goes on when we begin to devote all of our attention to screens, uh, into, into the net, into computers. And what we gain, as she put it, is new strengths in visual spatial intelligence, that kind of ability to keep track of lots of things going on simultaneously on a screen. We get better at that. But that comes at a very high cost, because what weakens is mindful knowledge acquisition, inductive analysis, critical thinking, imagination, and reflection. So however important it is to be able to keep track of lots of things simultaneously on a screen, I think most of us would agree that these qualities of thought are the really important ones. Um, that mindful knowledge acquisition that actually lets you say this is important and I should focus on this, critical thinking, imagination, and reflection, all of these things are absolutely essential to what we would define as deep thinking, as the, the highest levels of thought that our minds are capable of. To end, I think it's useful to compare the information environment that the screen provides us, that the net provides us, that the smartphone provides us, with the information environment that uh, one of the technologies that's being displaced provided us, which is the printed page, the printed book. Um, I don't have one in my hands, but <laughs> uh, we've, we've come to see this as kind of a hopelessly flawed technology in many ways, because you, you, know, you open up a book and, geez, there's just words here. You know, it's, <laughs> where, where are the links to click on? What, what, how can I check Facebook here? <laughs> and, 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 and because we're, we're so used to having this an information source that provides all these different features and all these different flows of information, this can seem kind of dull and, and not too much going on. But I would argue that that is actually the great strength of the printed page. The fact that there isn't anything going on except the words of a story or the words of an argument, and therefore you're kind of forced to focus on one thing for a long period of time. And I think that's an unnatural way for human beings or any animals to think, to actually screen out distractions and concentrate your attention on one thing for a long period of time. So I think the, the printed page was extremely valuable as a technology that aided us in learning how to pay attention, learning how to concentrate and control our mind uh, in very, very different model of taking in information than the model that is rapidly replacing the printed page, which is the network connected screen. And if you're under any illusion that there's some battle going on between these two technologies, forget it, that battle is over. <laughs> the average American adult today spends eight and a half hours looking at a screen. That's TV, computer, cell phone, smartphone, whatever. That same adult spends 20 minutes reading from a printed page. So we've, we've made this massive shift in the dominant media, and we've made it very, very quickly, and I fear we've made it without thinking about what might be lost as we move from a technology that encourages attentiveness to one that actively <laughs> discourages it. There's, this is, a very, to me, a very bleak chart, but I have to say that since I, since I wrote The Shallows a couple of years ago, there are some encouraging signs emerging. Um, E-books, which were going through the roof and, and taking market share away from printed books at the time, have actually come down now and seem to be 
seem to have reached a plateau of about 25% of overall book sales. So today, 25% of books are sold as ebooks, 75% are still sold as print, and that, at the moment, it's, hard, it's impossible to predict what's going to happen in the future, but at the moment it seems fairly stable. So there does seem to be this desire, at least among some people, book readers, to maintain the kind of information environment, the calmer information environment that tends to come from printed page and pages and that you tend to lose when you switch to a multitasking device. So I'll just end with a thought, um, something that the late uh, American novelist David Foster Wallace said back in 2005 when he gave a commencement address at a, at a college, I think it was Kenyon College, and what he talked about was the importance of being able to pay attention, uh, the importance of being able to focus your mind. And he told the students, learning how to think means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. And I would argue, and what I would leave you with, is the idea that the biggest danger that this wonderful technology that we've created and that is so useful in so many ways, the biggest danger it presents is that it is stealing from us the ability to make conscious choices about what we pay attention to, uh, what we ignore, how we focus our mind or how we don't focus our mind, and we're allowing the technology itself more and more to make those choices for us. And as soon as you give up, as, as David Foster Wallace implied, as soon as you give up that kind of control over your own mind and your own thoughts, you're basically dooming yourself to a much sparser, much shallower intellectual life than you would enjoy if you actually controlled your own attention and were in charge of what you looked at and focused on and thought about. So thank you all for your attention. All right, uh, you can all check your phones now. <laughs> no. We have time for a few questions. Uh, Dave Merker is going to come around with a mic, and then we also have one. So if you could speak into the mic, that would help us because we're recording this. So any questions for Nick? Anyone? Hi, that was, is this on? That was a fantastic talk. Um, I was wondering how you feel about internet access in the classroom for students. Um, <laughs> the, I think it's, I think a lot depends on what's being taught and how old the kids are that it's being taught to. I don't, I think the assumption that it's always good to have internet access during a class of, of any sort is, is a mistaken assumption. Um, there is a, an interesting study done at Cornell a couple of years ago where um, they, they held a lecture class and half the students were allowed to open their laptop and go online and stuff and the other half couldn't do that. Um, and what they found was that the people who didn't use their laptop retained much more of the information in the lecture than the other group. And they found that it didn't even matter what the people who were online were doing. Uh, the people who looked at websites related to the material did just as poorly as those who like went to Zappos and bought shoes. So <laughs> there, it seemed to be just the, the distraction that comes from you know, having a screen going and stuff to look at seems to reduce comprehension and, and memory formation. And I think it goes back to that, that you know, small capacity of our working memory. Every time you add another load of information, you tend to reduce the ability of people to form memories. So if it's, you know, if the, if the net or the computer is a tool that is being used specifically in the class, that's one thing. If it's, if it's just, you know, go ahead and go online during the class, then, then I think you have to expect that people are going to learn less than they would have otherwise. Nick, why don't you guide Well, I'd, I need to wait for the, oh, okay. One of these. Fellows in the front, can you just wait for the, right down here in front? I can speak loudly, so. Well, you, they're recording it, so you can't, probably can't speak that loud. Thanks. Sorry. So, so thank, thank you. Um, 
as you think about the connected generation coming into the business world, how do we accommodate for that? How do we help them make that transition into the world of critical thinking for success? Um, well, before, before I answer that, I, I think there are, I don't see this in strictly generational terms. I think there's a whole lot of adults who are absolutely <laughs> as uh, compulsive users of, of gadgets and smartphones as kids. And so I think this is, I think the problem, if, if you agree there's a problem, crosses generations. But I think you're right that um, the generation that has been brought up with the expectation that they can uh, or the illusion that they can multitask successfully and check information and, and also do, thing, do work well, um, it, is a, it is a challenge. And I don't really know how you deal with that. I, I think there are two ways company, companies are, tend to be pursuing it. And one is to redefine work in a way that says it's OK to be distracted all the time. Um, and we'll just try to make do. And what they often lose, even though they don't realize, is, is it it is productivity and creative thinking because too much distraction reduces both of those things. But the one suggestion I would have is that a lot of companies up till now have provided incentives or at least encouragement for people to be constantly online. Um, in a lot of companies, if you don't, if you're not constantly checking messages and replying very, very quickly to messages and processing information very quickly, you can feel like you're, you're harming your career because you're being judged by how quickly you process information. And so one thing that companies can do is, is realize that there are times when you want people to be connected and, and interacting very quickly. And there are other times when you want to say, don't go online, disconnect, think deeply. And I think that becomes more and more important when you have younger people coming into the workforce who, who need that kind of encouragement and those kind of opportunities to feel comfortable disconnecting um, in, in, when they need to. My, while you're here. Are there, are there any uh, processes or technologies or whatever being developed to um, add um, critical thinking, deep thinking to this type of device? Uh-huh. Well, <laughs> the, the good news is that... <laughs> the good news is that there, are, that there, there is progress being made uh, on that front. I'm, I'm saying, well, we've created... By default, kind of, we've created software and interfaces that encourage distraction and... and, and discourage attentiveness, well, can we design those in different ways? And so you see, you see lots of um, experimentation with that, with, with interfaces that are much calmer, that, that take over the whole screen, and so you don't have that feel of multitasking all the time. There are particular apps that allow things like, that are called freedom or uh, antisocial that lock you out of the internet or lock you out of Facebook for a certain amount of time. Um, so software that kind of prevents you from using software. It's kind of a strange way to deal with the situation, but it works for some people. So, so I think there is, you know, among software writers, among technology companies, there is an appreciation now that maybe we've gone too far in one direction. Maybe we should explore new ways of presenting information that encourage attentiveness. And I mean, I certainly hope, what we don't know now is whether those will be adopted, actually, by, by people who have, we've kind of trained ourselves not to want those kind of calm computing environments. But I, I, I think, you know, even in the years, since, in a couple of years since I, since I wrote the book, I, I've been encouraged that this is, has become an issue, at least, that technologists, software programmers are, are grappling with. David You have mentioned um, ethical issues. Uh, I, 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 I want to touch upon simple politeness and what society can do uh, in, in the social sphere with feelings. All of us often observe a young couple, uh, married or not, or first date, sitting at a bar 
each one looking at their <laughs> iPhone, or, or a break up with each other. Uh, I have a 25-year-old daughter, so this is uh, by iPhone or uh, being at a professional meetings, more and more it's totally acceptable behavior when people look at their Blackberries uh, or their computers, obviously not connected uh, with what is being discussed at the meeting. So I wonder, that's the way it is? Uh, or, or society can somehow uh, influence uh, more politeness? Well, I mean, society definitely influences behavior, but, but so far it's been in the opposite direction. Because it, if you think about it, it wasn't that long ago that if you were having a conversation with someone and they pulled out a gadget and started <laughs> looking at it, it would have been like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> that's that's weird and rude, and now it's actually normal. So, so society ha has begun to say, it's OK to do that. And, and unfortunately, we're kind of adapting, and, and we're going in that direction. And so you, you, you know, even when you're talking to a friend or somebody that's close to you, I think all of us now, and some of, I, I should say that we've, had, we've been on both sides of this, but you have that sense, even if they're not glancing at their, their phone and <laughs> while they're talking to you, they're wishing they could <laughs> glance at their phone. You get that, that look like, oh, I wonder, or, wonder what that message says. And <laughs> probably more interesting than you. And, and, so, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think what we're seeing is that the technology changes social expectations, social norms. And so far, it's been in the direction to say, you know, it's OK to be of two minds all the time and to not really pay attention or to at least have your attention divided. Will we go in the opposite direction? Well, you know, I think that's kind of up to us. I, and I would say the prospects are probably not good. <laughs> right there. Well, um, this is more of a comment than a question. Great lecture, by the way, and it really reminded me of an article that my dad sent me through snail mail about, um, <laughs> it was actually cut from the Guardian Weekly. And so the article was talking about how professors at colleges can tell when students like got distracted while writing a paper. Like they could literally pinpoint the like the paragraphs where the students checked Facebook or went online because they would, there would be a discoherence in their argument. So that really reminded me of that. That's, that's interesting. Why did, he, why did he clip it out and send it to you rather than, <laughs> rather than send yeah, you a link? Email just email it to me. He clipped it out of his Guardian Weekly. <laughs> I think the Guardian's online. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> he got a free subscription. Over uh, here and then up there. I'm just curious um, about what's going on in the brain when people connect so that it's so difficult to disconnect. So because what, what, what we're thinking is that, and, and whether these changes with, the, uh, with different life cycles of the person. So right now we're seeing that young people, for instance, are connected and so on all the time. So how easy will it be to switch from one model, if you want, of connectivity versus another one? Versus, or we are just once we're connected, we feel that it's it's kind of like uh, this, uh, like the alcoholics that do not have the alcohol that that that, that feels that they need to be connected. Um, there, there is evidence, and again, a lot of the the neuroscientists is still coming into shape, so you can't make definitive conclusions. But there is evidence that that our brains reward us for, for seeking out new information uh, and for, for finding new information, that there's a release of dopamine in the brain, which is very important neurotransmitter chemical that gives pleasure and basically encourages you to repeat certain activities over and over again. And it's a very, very important <laughs> neurotransmitter for, for brain function, but it's also connected with various addictions and compulsions because if you're rewarded for doing the wrong thing, you keep doing the wrong thing. So we seem, to be, we seem to have this deep instinct within us to want to be connected, want to get, gather information as quickly as possible. And I think you can understand it probably in evolutionary terms. I, I mean, you know, back in caveman and cavewoman days, you wanted to know everything that was going on around you. You wanted to know that the wild animal was going to pounce on you in a, two seconds or that there was this 
berry bush that you could get some food. So, so you can see why we'd, we'd develop in a way that rewards us for, for seeking out and gathering information. Where that becomes a problem is when you create this new environment where there's no end to the new information, it becomes very, very hard to turn off that instinct. So, you know, I think we have, we're, we're human beings, we can exercise choice in discipline, but you have to really make a conscious effort to stop yourself uh, from defaulting to that kind of primitive behavior, I think. Well, <clears throat> I was going to ask about choice in this matter, and you just uh, answered my question before I could. It seems like it's like they used to tell you that TV would rot your brain, and if you made the choice to sit and watch a uh, soap opera 12 hours a day, it would. So. I, uh, I consciously avoid certain things on the internet for exactly the reasons you're talking about. So there is choice in this. I think that's absolutely right. Right, and choice and, and personal choice is is very important part of it. But I I would also say that it's it's not to to think of it as just a matter of choice misses the fact that the expectation of being online is beginning to be built into all sorts of society's processes. So you can't, you can't kind of do anything anymore without going online. Government expects you to do things online. Schools do. Uh, your social life, if you're, particularly if you're a young person, you know, if you disconnect, you're disconnecting from your social life. So there's, there's the personal choice, and then there's societal expectations and norms as well. That's, that's the signals that get sent, yeah. As a former teacher, um, I'm very concerned about the fact that um, education in this country doesn't seem to pay much attention to how the brain works. Um, we, don't, we don't give time between lessons for the, for the brain to acclimate to what they've just learned and that kind of thing. And it seems to me that we're going still much more in the wrong direction um, with, with the technology that you're talking about. And I'm wondering what we can do, what I can do, but is there, an, is there something that we can do to start helping to refocus education in our country? And I'm talking about public education, uh, high school and, and elementary school. Yeah. Uh, I think that, I think you're absolutely right because, and that was one of the kind of striking things that I discovered through my research is that a lot of the studies about cognitive overload, about, you know, what's the correct pace to supply people with information so that they, you optimize learning, a lot of that is done by uh, researchers in educational psychology. So there's this fairly big now body of work that says you, you, you have to, you know, parcel out the information you supply, and as you say, you have to give people time to think about it and rehearse it in order to remember it. And yet, it's all out there, but it seems to me that very, very little of it is taken into account as we, as we design our educational system. And I think the, the kind of trend toward pushing more and more screens into schools at ever younger ages, um, goes against everything we know. It goes against what we know about preventing cognitive overload. It goes against what we know about the importance of giving young students a diversity of experience and not pushing them all into through the same medium. So again, you know, we're at a point where the momentum is on, I think, the wrong side. That doesn't mean that the momentum can't change, but it does strike me that, you know, if if we slowed down a little bit in pushing our educational system in one direction and actually paid attention to the research, uh, we might make smarter choices for our schools and, and, and for our kids. And I can only hope that you know, people promulgate this, this research and it actually has an effect, um, which it really hasn't up until now. Maybe just one more question. how your writing has changed um, with all these distractions if you find that you have a harder time focusing and writing books now? I d uh, yes, I do. <laughs> um, 
and so what, because I, I'm by no means, you know, I, uh, I, I, I'm not like a model citizen when it comes to, you know, withstanding the temptation to go online. I do plenty of that. Um, but when I started work on the shallows, be, you know, because I was having trouble reading, I was having trouble researching, and I was having trouble writing, I, I did change some of my habits. So I tried to think more critically about, you know, what is, what is this technology really good for and what is it not so good for? So for instance, when I'm doing research now, I, I often use search engines and the web to discover relevant information, discover books I should look at, articles I should look at, journal articles I should look at. But then once I've found that, I actually go to a library and get the physical hard copies of the, of the articles or of the books and because I find that, you know, <coughs> focusing on printed text actually encourages that kind of attentiveness that I talked about. And I get much more out of my research and also have a tendency to calm down uh, my mind as well in, in doing that. So I think, you know, we're too quick to think that because the web is so fast and it, it can do so many things that we should use it for everything. Whereas really, it's very, very good for some things, but there are other technologies, other techniques that are actually better uh, for other things. So at least I'm trying to be more conscious of making that distinction and not simply uh, default to going online to do everything. And it, it has helped, I think. Oh. All right, great. Nick, thank you. Thank you.